Last week, our focus was on John the Baptizer's purpose, preaching character, and also his humility. Today, I'd like to focus our attention on Jesus' baptism, and I believe that this is when he is anointed by God the Father. And he's anointed in many different ways, you might say, uh, not just one. But to begin with, in regard to Jesus' baptism, he obviously did not need to repent nor to have his sins remitted. So he was not baptized for the remission of his sins. According to John chapter 1 and verse 29, this is John the Baptist. On the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus came to take away the sins and certainly he is sinless, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, for he, and this is God the Father, made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so Jesus was sinless, yet he took upon himself the penalty of sin by dying upon the cross. And so because John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, according to Mark chapter 1 and verse 4, I believe that is why John responded as he did to Jesus. So, Jesus comes to him to be baptized and John says, no, <laughs> I'm not going to. He says, it says in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 14, and John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? John understood that those who he was baptizing, he was baptizing that they would come in an act of repentance, but it was for the remission of sins. Knowing that Jesus didn't have anything that he needed to be baptized for in that context anyways, tried to prevent him. And so we must ask the question, why then was Jesus baptized? Well, we would see first and foremost what the scriptures say in Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, or are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So there's our answer, to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, that is John, allowed him, Jesus, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, this idea of fulfill, or this word that we have translated fulfill, means to perform or to execute. So what Jesus is saying is that I need to execute righteousness. And in the broad sense, righteousness is the state of Him who is such as he ought to be, righteousness, the condition acceptable to God. And so, it, there's further explanation, you might say, or uh, definitions given there in integrity, virtue, purity of life, uprightness, correct, correctness in thinking, feeling, and acting. Zur, who uh, in, in his commentary on the New Testament wrote, which I think he, he worded it very well. But while he had, that is, Jesus had no sins to confess, he did have a duty to perform. And by so doing, he could remain, or he could maintain his integrity. When this ex explanation was made to John, he promptly performed the baptism and thus cooperated in the act that Jesus said would be fitting or becoming. And so Jesus is saying, I have a duty to fulfill. 
I have to execute righteousness in this act of being baptized. We know that it didn't end there. A second reason is that there's a connection between he and John through this act of baptism on Jesus' part. Notice over in John chapter 1, verses 32 and 34. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him. And that is, we've made this point already that John did not know that Jesus was the Messiah, the one chosen by God. Obviously, their paths had crossed being cousins, but he did not know that he was the one. And so it continues, verse 33, I did not know him, but he who sent me, that is God the Father, sent me to baptize with water, said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So Jesus' baptism identified him as the Messiah, the one chosen by God that then John would know that he is the one. A third reason is to make a connection between he and all humanity. We'll see at the end of Jesus' life in Matthew chapter 28, in verses 18 and 19, right before His ascension to the Father. This is after His death, burial, and His resurrection. And Jesus came and spoke to them. This is to the apostles saying, All authority has been given to Me in heaven and on earth. Therefore go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so, it is a confirmation, if you will. It's still following in the footsteps of Christ to be baptized, even though we're not being baptized with that same intent that Jesus had, and that is to fulfill all righteousness. We need our sins remitted. We need our sins forgiven at the time of baptism. But it is still that same act in which we follow in the footsteps of Christ to be immersed in water. The fourth reason would be that Jesus provided an example and expected his, his believers to follow, as we've pointed out already, just to uh, emphasize, you might say, that we are going to be like our Savior. And the fifth reason is it gives us our first glimpse into the Godhead. Up until this point, I don't know of a, a time in which all three are represented at one single time. If there is, please bring that to my attention. But I do believe this is the first time. It wouldn't be the last time, but it's definitely the first time. And so we see in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So we have represented here the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We have the Spirit descending like as a dove would come flying down and land on a limb, you might say. And we have God speaking God the Father speaking from heaven. So you have the, the Godhead represented on this occasion in which Jesus is baptized. We'd also note that this is a confirmation of Christ's identity. Uh, this is a very special time. Jesus is declared by God the Father, the beloved Son of God, in whom He is well pleased. It is another statement made at His transfiguration, hear ye Him, that is excluded here, but nevertheless He's identified. That's important. We will see in a couple of weeks, Lord willing, that the devil focuses attention on that question, if you will. The credibility of the proclamation that God makes at the time of Jesus' baptism, that He is indeed the Son of God. And so, three times, Satan says, if 
you are the Son of God. Because it would seem that he has not uh, been put in the ministry yet, that, that he has not exercised any of the qualities of deity at this point in time. And so Satan's going to key in on this very thing that's contrary to what God the Father has declared, and that is, this is my beloved Son. And he doesn't beat around the bush. He goes right straight to the heart of it. If you are the Son of God. Now, God spoke from heaven at other times, but it's very rare. I have a full list here. Hagar, Abraham, Mount Sinai. Uh, God spoke to King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, God spoke to Jesus in John chapter 12 and verse 28. The Jesus transfiguration that I mentioned earlier that we'll come across in chapter 9 of Mark. And God spoke to, to Peter from heaven in, in Acts chapter 11 and uh, verse 9, talking, you know, when the sheet came down and he's going to be sent to the Gentiles and so on. But this is a very, very rare time in which God would speak from heaven. But it was an affirmation, a declaration that Jesus is the Son of God. We would note that angels spoke at His birth in Luke chapter 1, verses 34 and 35. That He is eternal. Well, I have... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping down a little bit. That uh, He is declared by the demons themselves in Mark chapter 3 and verse 11. And I'm looking forward to that part of the study and we'll, we'll see that there are quite a few times, in fact, that the demons know that Jesus is the Son of God. They address Him as such. Of course, John declares this in John chapter 1 and verse 34, as we've already said, Behold the Lamb of God. His apostles in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 33, they say, truly you are the Son of God and they worship Him. We would also see Peter makes that declaration. You know, Who do men say that I am? Well, some say Elijah. Some say that you're John the Baptist that's been uh, reincarnated. Come back from the dead. And uh, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, speaks up and says, you are the Son of God. There are affirmations also that Jesus is the Son of God at His birth. As we mistakenly said earlier in Luke chapter 1, verses 34 and 35, that He has an eternal existence over in John chapter 17 and verse 5. He says there, I am not of this world. And in John chapter 8 and verse 58, he says, Before Abraham was, I am. We would also see that he has the power to forgive sins in Mark chapter 2, 5 through 12. Remember, the man is let down through the roof. We'll come across that quite quickly in our study. He's also counted as the Word. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, and then in verse 14. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things that were created through Him were created by Him through Him. And then, of course, in verse 14, that the Word became flesh, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's also declared the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead. In Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which He promised before through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. 
And so as we read here in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, He saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon Him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Although not stated here in the context, as in our title, Jesus is anointed by the Father. And I'd like to spend our last few moments in uh, making these four points. First of all, that Jesus' baptism marks an initiation of Jesus being anointed as a teacher, a prophet, a high priest, and a king. This was not oil poured on His head. It would seem that it is in this baptism, in this immersion in water, the declaration of God from heaven and the beginning of Jesus' ministry, save going into the wilderness led by the Spirit to be tempted. We're actually going to separate those into two lessons. I only had one person come back to me and when I asked for your feedback, should we go through this uh, rapidly, you might say, or in detail? Well, you all got overruled and it's going to be in detail <laughs> because that's what that person requested. And hopefully they get something good out of it along with yourself. Again, I understand that this is in the sense reading between the lines. We know that Jesus is the King of Kings in the Lord of Lords. But when did He become that? When did He become that prophet that was spoken of? When did He become the good teacher? Well, I'm going to say that it, this is where it begins. This is a pivotal time. He is about 30 years old. And having lived 30 years, it's time. And boy, does it go rapidly. Many of us are beyond that 33 and a half years old. And I don't know about you, but when I look back, I think, wow, there could have been a whole lot more done. <laughs> Why didn't God spare His life a little bit longer than three and a half years as far as ministry is concerned? But it was sufficient. And God knew what He was doing. And I believe that this is the beginning. As I have already stated, that He is that teacher. In Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 36, we read there, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after His baptism, which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with Him. This, of course, this context in Acts chapter 10 is the conversion of Gentiles. And it is being stated by Peter that he goes back to the fact that he is a preacher of peace, that Jesus Christ is a preacher of peace. And then in verse 37, that it began from Galilee after the baptism of John. And of course, he goes out and then we would see in verse 38 specifically spoken how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. So this context is Jesus beginning his ministry and going out and teaching. 
Secondly, we would see that he is that prophet in which was anticipated. In Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 22, this is what is known as Peter's second sermon, second to the sermon at Pentecost, and of course the other apostles, all, they all stood up, it says. But in verse 22, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, and that is like Moses, from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. It's one of the things that I've tried to emphasize through the years through my teaching of Jesus Christ to help people wrap their minds around it. Is that at Mount Sinai, when God is going to, when He did speak from heaven, that the mountains quake, they shook, they were smoke. And when God spoke, it scared them to death. Only in the New Testament does it say that even Moses trembled. And at that time, they were so petrified that they requested of Moses to tell God not to ever have him speak to them again because it scared them so. Peter is referring back to that time when God says, you're right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send a prophet like you, referring to Moses. And so that's what we're reading here, in which Peter is expressing. And it says in verse 23, again of Acts chapter 3, And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. The Word, because he hadn't been given the name Jesus, he hadn't been begotten of the Father yet. John chapter 1, the Word, in that sense, is the same as the Father. I'm not saying that they're, they're, I, they're, they're one in the same, but they're in unison as much as we've already noted in regard to Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. They understood that. Jesus is saying He is the one who spoke to Moses. When Moses says, Who am I going to say sent me? And He says, You tell them, I am. And so, Jesus is eternal God. He's not... God the Father, and He's not God the Holy Spirit, but He is God the Word. Who put on the flesh, was given the name Jesus, which means Savior. And what Peter's expressing here is what was being reiterated and spoken hundreds of years before, is that yes, I'm going to raise up a prophet. Like you, Moses. Moses is a lawgiver and he's also a deliverer. You better listen to him. Moses himself was a spokesman for God. He was a prophet of God. And Jesus is following in his footsteps, if you will, in verse 24. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our father saying to Abraham, in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 12. <coughs> to you first, God having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you, to turn away every one of you from your iniquities. You must listen to this prophet that I send. If you don't, there are dire consequences. And so, 
it is that we should listen to Jesus. He is declared the Son of God, and at this time I believe that He's anointed in that sense, prophet. He's also our high priest according to Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify Himself to become high priest, but it was He who said to Him, You are My Son, today I have begotten You. And so He is our high priest. Many other verses, of course, that we can look at. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 13, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which He will manifest in His own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be glory, or excuse me, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. And so he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is where it begins, if you will, at the at his baptism and at his being anointed as such. If it doesn't begin here, where would it begin? <laughs> Maybe in his, his existence, if you will, of on this earth. But it would seem that nothing is spoken of until this moment. The declaration of Jesus, or excuse me, of the Father to Jesus in the hearing of John, and possible other witnesses, but certainly in the witness of, G, of John seeing the Spirit descend upon him. And at that point in time, he is certainly declared the Son of God, which goes along that he is that teacher, that prophet, our high priest, and our king. So Jesus' baptism was to fulfill all righteousness and to confirm that he was the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And if you're ready to give your life to Him, won't you come?